Hello, everybody. So I found a place where there's not too many people. And I was drawn here by a woodpecker that was making a sound, and just incredible sound. And it's not the first time that an animal has alerted me to something, right? That paying attention to signals from nature has allowed me to discover something that's very important to me or new. Um, but, but what I began thinking about was the idea that a woodpecker led me here and how we as humans, we have this, uh, this relationship with categories and instances in our language that much of the time makes us dumb because we will think, oh, what is that? Oh, it's, a, it's an animal. Oh, it's a bird. Oh, it's a woodpecker. And we end there. We think, we, we think thereby that we've understood the phenomenon when that's not possible. Um, and that way of relating with categories is part of what has damaged our capacities for intelligent humanity. Um, we believe that our categories are good and true and relatively complete. I'm here to tell you they're terrible. Um, they're the kind of categories you'd use to classify things but not to relate with them. And we've forgotten an incredibly important fact that when we make distinctions, when we determine the category that some phenomenon belongs to and you know, what uh, the instance is, for example, you know, it's, it's something, it's an animal, it's a bird, it's a woodpecker, and then usually we're done. Um, when we do that, we're changing the structure of our intelligence in a way that leads to catastrophic errors. We don't, we don't realize that as we make distinctions in phenomenon, we're changing the, the underlying structure our minds are capable of expressing and experiencing. And this is a catastrophically important discovery, right? To, to recognize this changes your relationship with the possibilities of your own intelligence forever. And there were brilliant men and women and many children throughout history. In fact, children tend to suspect these problems when they're very small, they, t they can tell the adults are playing a really weird game with language and categories that doesn't look right to the children. Um, and many of the children will even talk to each other about this and, and ask, you know, make, make bonds and say like, if I ever start doing that weird thing the adults are doing with language and knowledge, stop me or you know, help me or fix me or rescue me, right? But there were many brilliant men and women throughout history who recognized that our relationships with categories, language, and knowledge are fundamentally broken. And they're broken in such a way that's going to continue to make us dumber every time we use them until we learn or rediscover or invent something better. And one of the reasons we're not doing that is that the contexts that we're immersed in the contexts from which we derive our understandings of value and meaning and reward and punishment and so on, these contexts are unimaginably inhibitive. Um, and in the beginning, most of us rebel against that when we're very young, but eventually over time, the vast majority of us, we break down under constant pressure from peers and you know, uh, uh, people we work with and authorities and um, cultural forces and so on, most of us eventually break down. Some of us don't, right? Um, and some of us who have lived, who are brilliant geniuses, I'm going to come back to that word in just a moment, people like, mm, I don't know, uh, everyone, there are different kinds of genius, right? So there are artistic geniuses like Frida Kahlo or Leonora Carrington or um, uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, or, you know, brilliant vocalists or dancers. Um, there are, oh, the woodpecker, the woodpecker, it's calling again. Um, there are scientific geniuses like Einstein and um, Bohr. There are mathematical geniuses like Kurt Gödel uh, and, and John Nash. Um, by the way, as I'm in a relatively new 
physical context, I'm going to be paying attention somewhat to the ground because there are dangers here I'm not used to avoiding. You can hear the woodpecker that is the being that called my attention to this area where there are not very many people. <laughs> so there's different kinds of expression of genius and because I'm using language and I'm talking about categories, I'm going to talk briefly about one of the ways to understand what I'm referring to when I use this word genius. The common understanding of the word genius is a quality of unusual, unusually prodigious uh, insight, wisdom, skill, articulation, understanding, um, behavior, uh, so on and so forth, right? Like someone or a group of people, a team, that are so far beyond what we, you know, what we're used to, what we consider ordinary, that they stand out. And this is part of why we call actors who become very famous stars. Um, a very interesting phenomenon since what those people are actually engaged in, generally speaking, is either a form of trance in which they attempt to become another person that they're not, usually, or mimicry, right? Extremely advanced mimicry skills. And mimicry plays a crucial role in a variety of the uh, topics and constellations of topics that I'd like to touch on here, even though, to be very honest with you, I'm, I'm improvising. And um, this is my second attempt at, at, at this improvisation since the first one was unfortunately lost. <laughs> uh, so let me talk a little bit about this perspective on genius. Um, our ordinary understanding, <clears throat> is, it's something like extra skill, right? It's, it's peculiarly extra skillful. But there's an older understanding that probably comes from, like, the Greeks, maybe, or possibly even before their time. And it's weird that we, would, that we would even use language like this. This language is weird. I'm referring to an ethnicity in order to indicate a time. And what do I mean by that time? I mean really like the time of Socrates and his philosophical and intellectual uh, ancestors and progeny, right? So sometime back then, um, genius was understood very differently. And it was something like this. In a superposition over your human life, there is either an aspect of yourself or a distinct uh, intelligence, right? A being that is an intelligence that longs to both uh, connect with you, to be connected to you, and to be expressed into human culture through your own um, development, growth, activity, behavior, vocation, creativity, and so on. And so people like Einstein or um, who knows, you know, Helen of Troy, I don't know. Um, these people, let me, let me just think for a moment. It's funny, my name memory is not, is not really up to its ordinary sophistication at the moment. Um, I'll have to let that be as it is. <laughs> In any case, many people we are each familiar with throughout history have expressed and experienced the indwelling in their life and minds and hearts and creativity of what we might refer to as their genius. And sometimes it was the case that they wanted to make something beautiful, um, some kind of creative act of art or dance or painting or sculpture or writing. Um, <clears throat> Madeline Le Ingalls uh, stories come to mind 
because they were so, they had such a foundational effect on me, as did the stories of many other um, science fiction authors and authoresses. But there were other people who wanted to advance human knowledge. Um, the first person who suggested, for example, that the heart pumped blood was summarily exiled from the medical establishment. Everyone said, no one can feel the heart pumping blood. There's no such thing. You can't, it's not a pump, it's a heater, um, so on and so forth, right? So initially, we get ideas about the category and instance of some phenomenon. And eventually, someone comes along and says, no, um, the heart is not a heater. It pumps blood. Now, the heart is not a pump. Whatever the heart might be, it can't be a pump, right? A pump is a machine that humans have derived from watching natural processes. So, <laughs> Whatever a heart might be, it's got to be something vastly more sophisticated with tons of different things that it does. It can't be a pump. And, you know, computers are not mines. Our ability to build computers is a natural derivation of certain aspects of our cognitive function. But computers will never be intelligent. Intelligence is a property, is a, is a quality proper to living beings and, and places, right? It's not a quality that objects can evince. It doesn't fit inside objects, right? Whatever apparent intelligence might come from computation is the result of humans having codified a structured mimicry of the functions of minds that are intelligent. And then, having made the mistake of thinking that uh, they could subtract themselves and their own influence from that constellation of, you know, uh, behaviors and functions, and pretend that magically the intelligence has now been transferred in in into a machine. It'll never happen. Wrong. It's a category error, right? So we have lots of problems like this in our relationship with knowledge and the categories that we presently presume to be useful and good I mean like I like I said about the the woodpecker right there's something there's an animal it's a bird it's a woodpecker yeah now of course we could use uh, the, the the Latin uh, biological constructs that include things like um, genus and species and phylum and class and so on and so forth. I'm sure I got those in the wrong order. Um, but, but again, that's just a classification system. That doesn't tell us what the nature of the phenomenon is, the way that it pretends to when we use these, when we enact these behaviors that distinguish specific elements of our experience, when we're doing that, we're changing the fundamental understructure of our minds. We're, we are determining what kinds of futures are possible for that intelligence and which ones are no longer possible, generally speaking. Not absolutely, except that we've learned to do this so emphatically that what we call knowledge, rather than revealing the nature of all that is to us, and inviting us into participation with it, it does the opposite. And this is what we call education today. This is what we've been calling education for a long, long time. Now, occasionally, some particularly inspired or insightful human being will come along and say, something's wrong with what the humans are thinking, how they are thinking about something like, for example, gravity, or light, or time. <laughs> um, Einstein is an, is an example that comes easily to hand uh, because the corrections that single individual who, by the way, needed the work of a vast constellation of people all throughout time, he was not singularly responsible for that uh, with which we credit him, right? And this is another error. We pretend that... Hmm, 
the aspect of us that participates in culture and cultures of popularity and fame and so on and so forth, we presume and pretend that exemplars of prodigy are standing on their own, right? It never happened, even one time. I certainly can't stand on my own. Exemplars of prodigy <laughs> emerge within concentric constellations of discovery, um, disclosure, description, modeling, assertion, argument, over vast periods of human time. So that when Einstein finally climbed up out of the collective muck of the nonsense then prevalent, much like Darwin or, or who knows, Joan of Arc, um, they're, they're, most, since men write the books, we know the names of men. I know, I know the names of men much, much more easily. The, the women are alive in my heart and my psyche <laughs> and have been my teachers. Um, but just like just about everybody, I'm relatively trained to remember the men and they come more easily to mind at the moment. So mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Um, just understand I have I also have the women in, in mind, because it's not merely men that are prodigies. Um, and I've been trying to remember the names of a few specific women who had a profound influence on me. Uh, I've mentioned some, some of the artists' names, but even some of those are escaping me. And part of it is because I'm using, <laughs> I'm doing the thing I was talking about, right? I'm using my mind in a specific array of ways for a specific array of purposes, and that doesn't necessarily enhance my huh, the library of names that I carry in my heart and my access to it in this moment. So I want to go back to this idea of genius, right? Um, we moderns use genius as a property. I think genius generally referred to a being. And most of us have some degree of experience of this thirst or this hunger, this hidden secret thing within us that aches to be acknowledged and expressed. And historically, the people who've been capable of expressing it, it's not just success that they experience, right? There's all kinds of, it can be absolutely catastrophic for a person's life to have that contact with genius and have it express itself into their um, academic or vocational or creative or relational context, right? Um, there's all kinds of stories of tragedy. Uh, the Minnelli, um, the mother and daughter, you know, uh, Liza Minnelli and her mother um, are, are examples that come quickly to mind. But there's all kinds of catastrophes that happen. And I think the Greeks were aware that the proximity of, of one's genius is both inc an incredible, astonishing opportunity to recognize and embody the deepest, most profound potentials of our human interiority and ability, at, while at the same time uh, being a razor walk between, you know, catastrophe and success. And, and in this case, catastrophe is often shockingly significant. Um, many people who became wildly famous had terrible lives. Similarly, people who uh, experienced profound financial success had catastrophically bad lives, although money can in some ways protect, you know, it can act in a protective way against some of the forces that might otherwise obliterate your, your humanity or your life. But, but I, my point is that we all, each one of us, and our cultures have a role to play here because when our cultures inhibit or educate us in such a way as to make our relationship with our inward genius either impossible, um, unthinkable, fantastical, right, oh, that's just a fantasy. When this kind of thing happens, 
our humanity falls down the rungs of a ladder we've been climbing for thousands of human generations. And we get trapped in terrain, and by that I mean um, the opportunity landscape is very crude and low grade, the threat landscape is exaggerated, um, the intelligence landscape takes catastrophic hits constantly almost every time we use our minds. And this is the situation that most people will live and die within, and most people have lived and died within for thousands of years. We're living in a context that literally punishes prodigy that it can't co-opt and sell us counterfeits of. And so even the people who manage to connect with their genius and manage to survive that incredibly complex process, which is very much like a second embry, a second, uh, a second embryology, right? Like, like becoming an embryo in another domain of our humanity and undergoing that same process of growth and maturation and successfully navigating potential points of catastrophe or crisis until finally we are born. This is the process, this process echoes, or rather, our relationship with genius, one of the best analogies for that is embryogenesis, right? Um, and thus we have, for example, uh, stories in religious books about what we would call the second birth. It's precisely because, I think, or at least, let me put it a different way, I don't like that language. The resemblance between our relationship with our genius and what could take place, or excuse me, what does take place if we successfully become a human being, right? We undergo embryogenesis. That relationship has lots of resemblance. Yeah, those, there are similar threats, there are similar opportunities, there are similar phases. Um, it's a developmental ladder that, res that, that I think resembles embryogenesis. Yet most of us, you know, we may have some casual experience of our genius if, for example, we write songs, or we write plays, or we write stories, or we make mathematic or scientific discoveries, or we are dancers, or we are actors, or we are screenplay writers, or perhaps um, we have some other degree of prodigy. Maybe the stock market just comes naturally to us. Uh, or, you know, you can think of almost any kind of behavior at which humans can excel and understand that it's conceivable that our genius can be involved in that and that although I think most of us have a relatively um, vague and distant relationship with that prodigy, uh, there are those of us in which it's direct and like lightning, right? And having had some experience of this myself, the reason that I'm telling this story is that I think it's a tragedy that these perspectives and orientations are not only no longer preserved in our modern culture, <laughs> their opposite reigns supreme, like a, like a tyrannical overlay, just like if you paved a living place, right? This is the analogy of, mo of, of what most human beings will experience of their interiority because our cultures and the context to which we are generally exposed reinforce a process that resembles circumcision on the organ of ourselves, in our souls, in our hearts, that is the organ within ourselves with which we relate with that genius, with our own genius, and with the genius of others. Because the genius of others, experiencing the genius of others, catalyzes memories and, and a hunger in ourselves, a knowledge that we too carry something like this. It's just so frustrated and inhibited that it cannot be expressed. 
And again, most of us will live and die with very little experience of that, although there are exceptions um, in our lives. And one of the places where exceptions are common is in dreaming. Um, <laughs> but even dreaming, our dreaming aspect is aware of this conflict. Yeah? And it will present figures that call us, it will present figures of struggle and confusion and frustration that call us back toward the possibility of reconnecting with, with our inner genius, even though the, an, the, hmm, even though it is as if the appendage, like let's say, um, we're born with a special kind of wings, and those wings lift us high enough that our genius can reach down to us and we can reach up to it uh, as if in that famous painting where Adam reaches toward the divine being and the divine being reaches down, as if that's a painting about everyone except it doesn't have to do with the interpretations we've heaped on that image, right? It has to do with something that's both universal and unimaginably personal. Well, just as personal as your own relationship with your sexuality, right? Except you have a capacity for relationships with a form of intelligence that humans have been too timid to conceive of. And the origins of your mind are the result of your relationships with that intelligence in childhood. Before you, were, before you underwent the process that, that I would analogize as, as, analogize as being circumcision, right? Um, and I think nearly all of us suffer dramatically from that cultural process, that circumcision. And I think it's a tragedy. And we can remedy this tragedy. And if we don't, we'll be making a terrible mistake that will cause unimaginable suffering and catastrophe. We need to do something other than what our cultures have been scripted to do for thousands of years, which is essentially, we need to be liberated from the paving over of our capacities for intelligence and relation with living places and living beings and living ideas. We need to be rescued from this, this pavement. This pavement has to be shattered and, and the, the green, verdant vitality of, the, of all that is hidden beneath that cruel, inhibition must see again the light of day within our lives and cultures. Without being commodified, without being sold back to us in little fucking packets of commodified bullshit, right? Um, now, when I speak of genius, I'm actually talking about a subject that would, that would change the meaning of all human categories. And there are such subjects. And people who we think of as geniuses, since I've been using him as my stalking horse, if I've got that <laughs> language right, um, I'll use Einstein, right? Einstein saw that there were fundamental problems with categories that if, if we get these categories wrong, it's impossible for us to get anything right. So one of the goals that he had, I think, was just to apply, I mean, he had really ambitious goals, but his, his simpler, more accessible goal was to get us to think differently about time, space, light, and gravity. Because those are fundamental properties of that which is, and if we've got those wrong, we can't get anything right. And what I'm suggesting is that we have other, uh, other categories wrong. The category of organism, we've got this wrong. And if you get that wrong, you can't get anything right. The category of human, if it doesn't include the genius, you've got it wrong. And if you've got the wrong idea of what genius is and you think it's a quality um, per peculiar to some specific human beings who get lucky enough to embody and express it, you've got it wrong, right? And if you get that wrong, everything's wrong. <laughs> There's a genius to nature. There's the genius of that woodpecker, right? 
that's making its call that drew me to this place and, and was the fertilizing catalyst of the video you're now watching. Is that included in the idea of woodpecker in English? Fertilizing catalyst of prodigy? No. <laughs> and as I, as I speak of this, the woodpecker gets louder and louder as if, as if it can hear me, as if it's celebrating being recognized beyond the categories we ordinarily presume to be sufficient when they cannot be thus and will never be thus. There's another aspect of genius which is um, encoded in, in the phrase genius loci, and that is the genius of a specific living place. And we human beings belong to these living places the way that wings belong to birds. But unfortunately, our relationship with knowledge, function, value, and commodity, proximity, place, all these things have been so catastrophically distorted that the only word I can come up with to describe such a process is amputation, right? I've used the word circumcision earlier, and this is a crucially important idea for me because the intelligences we bring to birth as children are ready to, they're, they're poised, they are um, perfectly prepared to acquire all different kinds of intelligent relationships with living places, with our genius, with other forms of non-human intelligence, with anything resembling intelligence in human culture, including language and knowledge and concepts and the stuff we acquire like a disease that mostly shuts the stuff down, cuts it off from our experience and access. When we're born as children, it's as if we have, I don't know, I'll just make up a number, say, uh, oh, 173 different, unique, um, it's not an appendage, what is it? We have a vast, a wildly exotic array of unique potentials for contact and relation with other forms of intelligence. And it is the genius we bring into, into birth as, as children that allows us to undergo the process of enlanguaging and enculturation that produces the crippled version of ourselves that we refer to as a mature modern adult. And that's a tragedy that I think has to come to an end. And it has to come to an end now. Not like someday in the future, with some future generation, or maybe somewhere, somehow, someone will accomplish this. We have to do this together for the sake of all of human history, for the sake of whatever future might be possible for our people, for the sake of the living places, for the sake of the, the history of, and future of life on earth. We have, to, we have to accomplish this because if we don't, the catastrophes that will therefrom ensue are both unimaginable and too tragic to evaluate. <laughs> now, one of the things that drew me today to this place was that we're, we're existing in this moment right now in a very unusual set of circumstances. Yeah. And one of the things that's happening for nearly all human beings right now is that the fundamental bases that we use to derive identity, value, meaning, proximity, um, opportunity, threat, reward, all of these foundational elements that whose constellation, right, we depend upon to determine what things are, what they are for, what can be done, what we will do, what we shouldn't do, what is good, what is bad, what is 
prodigious, what is ignorant, all of these sort of, um, all of these street signs, all of these, these pivotal inspirations, they have been tossed into chaos, right? They've been suspended. The, the, hmm. the pivotal, uh, as the stars were to ancient navigators, the entire sky of pivotal navigational elements has been completely thrown up in the air and is at this moment totally suspended. And what that means is both as individuals and as a, as a, as a, you know, a species and as nations, we are going to have to reestablish them and we're either going to reestablish the ones with which we were previously familiar or we're going to do something a little smarter and recognize that as we reestablish these uh, way posts of, of meaning and, and value and identity, we have the opportunity to do it in such a way that not only preserves the inherent capacities for prodigy, intelligence, humanity, kindness, generosity, wonder, awareness, and awe that are the unique gifts, our ancestral progenitors strove to bestow upon us. We can return 12 kinds of wings to our minds and hearts and our capacity for relationships. And that around which our human societies orbit, those markers of value and meaning and identity and reward and punishment and threat and opportunity, those markers represent a kind of gravity. They are in a way like the sun is. They draw specifically charactered constellations of behavior out of human populations over time. If we change those, we can change the behavior and we can recover the capacity to be an intelligent species. And that is a capacity we have long suffered without while pretending every other thing. And if that isn't obvious right now, it never will be. <laughs> it is always possible to raise the bar and it's always possible to raise it 15 rungs rather than two. And this is what genius is kind of about, right? It, it's, it's kind of about the sense that isn't necessarily proud um, or it doesn't need to accuse or denigrate. It simply points a path towards sudden, unimagin previously unimaginable developmental efflorescence. Huh? Right? You guys were dancing, we're gonna take you from dancing on the earth to dancing with the stars, okay? And not the ones on TV, the ones in the ocean of the sky that are the origin of minds and beings and life and the possibility of intelligence. And much of our human capacity for, for actually intelligent awareness and understanding and behavior it's tied up with our relationship with categories in language. Again, if you get those categories wrong, if you've got the wrong idea what genius means or the wrong idea what an animal is, or your idea of the sun is far too limited to have anything to do with what's actually going on in and as the sun. If you break, if those categories undergo lossy compression, which is exactly what's been happening, or at least is a perfect analogy, it's a technological analogy, that's what's been happening with the categories over evolutionary, over developmental time of human societies. 
the fundamental categories on which knowledge are based have been undergoing this incredibly, um, this rapidly accelerating process of lossy compression. And that means they lose dimensions of meaning, right? They lose dimensions accessible to our awareness of meaning and relation, possible relation, so that one day the woodpecker is just another bird. It's not, it's no longer a signal from eternity to the possibility of direct relation with the genius of a place, which is somehow an invitation to our own intrinsic genius and prodigy and spirit and soul and heart. When our hearts ache, that's a real sense. That's a sense more subtle than vision, but richer and older and deeper and absolutely trustworthy. It isn't that our hearts cannot be fooled into aching. Of course they can, and much of our media and what we call entertainment is, depends on the capacity to mimic prodigy and greatness in such a way that we become involved um, in a sort of reverse projection game, yeah? Where somehow the endlessly unfulfilled thirst, this endlessly unfulfilled hunger for excellence in the core of our being that is with us in every moment of every day of our lives and is sublimated because it is inhibited and frustrated and often punished or co-opted and commodified by our cultures, this prodigy we carry is hinted at in stories, in films, and we can be sold a kind of candy bar counterfeit where instead of reacquiring a relationship with our genius and embodying that, and fulfilling that, we will settle for the wrapper. We will settle for the appearance. We will settle for the mimic, for the mimicked storyline, right? That is reminiscent of something we were born to live far more than. Right now, the fundamental pivots of identity and meaning are suspended. They're in unknown positions. And some of them will fall back to earth in, in forms, in shapes that are worse than what they were before we entered pandemonium as a people. But we, in our capacity to form intelligent, humane, skillfully motivated unions, in that capacity, we have the opportunity right now, and that may be a short window, to establish something that actually resembles intelligent human culture so that the inherent, the staggering array of inherent faculties available to us as human beings will be returned to our common understanding, awareness, experience, and embodiment. And that is my dream. And that is the dream of my genius. A genius that I was so lucky to have touched in this lifetime directly and known in person a thing more astonishing than all the stories that I've ever been exposed to in human culture. <laughs> By thousands and thousands of times more. I can't express, there is no hyperbole significant enough <laughs> to express the difference between the actual experience of, of having that moment, however brief or long it may last, when one's humanity reaches into an unknown dimension high above the paved 
battlefield and makes contact with its essence. And that is a moment divine. And that is the origin. That's why we have, that's why we have all the mimicry. That's why we have all this entertainment. That's why we have religions. That's why we have technology. Those things are the shadows of our societal and communal failure to keep that possibility protected and alive and to reward it and to revere it. Not to overstand it, but to understand it together. So that is my dream. And I'm grateful to this living place and all of its living beings and to the woodpecker that has so often drawn me out from my humble shell into a situation where my intelligence feels at home. <laughs> Perhaps yours does too. Bye-bye for now.